throughout the world and across time, human beings have looked to water as the source of their existence. Again and again, creation myths, including the most popular of all time, Genesis, depict our world as being born of water. And God saith, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters, says Genesis 1. In the Babylonian creation myth, Abzu, the primordial freshwater ocean, and Tiamat, the primordial saltwater ocean, conceive the gods by mingling their waters together. The ancient Egyptians saw creation as a mound fashioned from the primordial watery abyss called Nu. In Norse mythology, the world coalesced from the water formed where the heat of Muspelheim, the plain of fire, met the cold of Nivelheim, the plain of ice. In one of many Hindu accounts of creation, Vishnu, the preserver, birthed the god Brahma, the creator, from his navel while lying in an ocean of milk. The ancient Greeks and Chinese, as ever, were more abstract and philosophical in their ontological musings. Rather than water, Hesiod sees the cosmos, or order, born from chaos, the yawning abyss, whilst early Confucian and Taoist texts depict the world as having emerged from hundun, or muddled confusion. But water is an ideal stand-in for such a primordial chaos. It is formless, ceaseless, seething matter. It has no purpose, yet it has power. It erodes the tallest mountains to nothing, and in the end brings all matter back to itself. We are all born in the waters of the childbed, and without it, we die. It is the mark of how far we have succumbed to entropy. When wounded, we bleed. When exhausted, we sweat. And when forlorn, we cry. Even those who have sought to unravel the creation story written by the cosmos itself, the endeavor we call science, have often looked to water. The Greek philosopher Thales, called the first scientist by Carl Sagan, believed water to be, quote, that from which is everything that exists, and from which it first becomes, and into which it is rendered at last. Unquote. Even the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier, who in the 18th century finally dispelled the four element cosmology of Aristotle by breaking water into its material components, couldn't help naming one of them hydrogen, which literally means the birth of water. Today, Scientists universally accept that this water-birthing element is the true primordial substance out of which all others are formed, forged in the furnaces at the cores of aging stars. The commonest path to creation is hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, and carbon into oxygen. Thus, it stands to reason that these would be, and indeed are, the commonest elements in the universe. But if you recall from my first video in the series, helium is chemically inert, and carbon is consumed in the creation of oxygen. Therefore, the two commonest chemically reactive elements in the universe are hydrogen and oxygen, the parents of water. Very likely, this would make water the most abundant compound in the universe. But creation myths aside, our universe did not form from water. Even hydrogen did not escape formation unscathed, thanks to primordial nucleosynthesis. For a brief period after the Big Bang, pressures and temperatures across the universe were equal to those of the core of a star, and a sizable portion of its hydrogen hoard was fused into heavier elements, such as helium and lithium. Any higher steps on the elemental ladder would require the first generation of stars to form live and die before they could spice the cosmic primordial soup. In 2015, a group of theoreticians at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics modeled several versions of the early universe and discovered that even in conditions a thousand times poorer in oxygen than now, such as those that existed 700 million years after the Big Bang, 
or 13 billion years ago, give or take, water could have existed in concentrations similar to today. This is largely because the universe's ambient temperature, today just 2.4 degrees above absolute zero, was then around 300 K, or 27 Celsius. This additional energy would have accelerated the interstellar chemical reactions that led to the formation of water. Today, water is formed on dust grains, but in the early years of the universe, little dust would have been available, so water could only form from direct elemental interactions, which would have become less common as the universe expanded and cooled. This year, astronomers at the European Southern Observatory in Chile detected the presence of water in a 13 billion year old proto galaxy, just the right age predicted by models. More astoundingly, in 2011, astronomers at Caltech and JPL were studying a 12 billion year old quasar, an active galaxy home to a supermassive black hole 5,000 times more massive than the Milky Way's, and found it to be home to the single largest mass of water ever detected. A hundred solar masses, equivalent to the largest stars ever found, and 4,000 times the amount that exists as vapor in our own galaxy's interstellar medium. How such a monster, in which material raging around the central black hole at near-relativistic speeds produces energy equivalent to a quadrillion suns, could be home to such a vast supply of water, is not mentioned in the paper, though it does say that it surrounds the central quasar in a hot cloud roughly 600 kelvins in temperature and hundreds of parsecs wide. The detection was made thanks to one of water's most appreciated properties. It is an excellent absorber and retainer of heat, and so acts as a coolant for such entities as quasars, shifting their emitted light into lower, less energetic registers. This property also makes water an invaluable ingredient in the formation of stars. Stars form from collapsing regions of interstellar clouds, possibly triggered by a supernova or similar disturbance. As they collapse, a process that takes about 100,000 years, Friction drives the temperature of the falling gas from about 15 K to over 11 million K. This gargantuan heat drives gas outward again, slowing or even halting the collapse. To proceed, star formation requires the presence of effective coolants. Initially, when temperatures are low, carbon monoxide and oxygen serve that function. But as the pressures and temperatures increase, water becomes ever more important as a release valve. The still unobserved first generation of stars, called Population 3 stars, must have formed in the absence of any more complex molecules, and so rely purely on their surrounding hydrogen for cooling. Since hydrogen is a less efficient coolant than any of its future offspring, the surrounding nebula would have been much hotter, and the resulting stars would have been gigantic, hundreds of times the mass of the Sun. Such stars could only have lived, at most, a million years. Any universe with only them within it would be one devoid of life. For stars to be born fertile, they must be born in water. And in 2012, astronomers using the European Space Agency's Herschel Space Telescope observed what might be the very start of such a birth. Linz 1544 a cold, starless nebula in the constellation Taurus, was shown to possess water vapor equivalent to 2,000 times the volume of Earth's ocean. This water appeared to be flowing in the direction of a gathering gravitational well, indicating that a star was about to awaken. Water makes an excellent diagnostic tool for the study of starbirth, since it exists as vapor in the warmer star-forming regions, but freezes out as temperatures decrease. It can act as a marker for where stars are forming. This association of water with star formation is reaffirmed by studies of protoplanetary disks, such as the famous ring around the young star Beta Pictoris, which shows that water forms a significant component of the material in orbit around young stars, and thus the planets and other worlds that eventually form around them. In 2011, a team at Leiden University in the Netherlands employing the Herschel Observatory, saw a young protostar in the constellation of Perseus eject a gargantuan amount of water, roughly a hundred million times the flow of the Amazon, from its poles. 
at 2,000 kilometers per hour, showing that just as infalling water enables star birth, so birthing stars can also seed the universe with water. That water presages the formation of stars, and thus planets, is seemingly borne out by studies within our own solar system. Models suggest the cold environment of interstellar space is more likely to produce water-containing deuterium, or hydrogen with an extra neutron, than the warmer environs of the protoplanetary disk. Given that current deuterium levels in Earth's oceans are far too high to have originated solely within the disk, modelers conclude that much of Earth's water, as much as 50%, must have originated in interstellar space, and thus predates the Sun. One of the most spectacular discoveries about celestial water is that when excited to higher energy levels by, say, orbiting a black hole, when it returns to its normal ground state, it emits a beam of microwave frequency laser light, or maser, that can be a thousand times more luminous than the sun. These beams can act as beacons that allow observation of normally invisible things, like black holes, or of incredibly distant things, like primordial galaxy. Another much more intense maser was employed to track one exceptionally anomalous object, a moving supermassive black hole. Most supermassive black holes are content to remain snug in the cores of their galaxies, but the light of water masers was able to show that, somehow, one supermassive black hole was traveling at close to 200,000 kilometers per hour. No one knows what sent such a massive object moving, but the only plausible candidate is another supermassive black hole. Perhaps it was the recoil from a collision between two smaller black holes. The most powerful water maser ever observed, called a Giga Maser because it was billions of times more powerful than those observed in our own galaxy, were found in TXS 2226184, an active galaxy about 350 million light years away. The source of the emission alone is believed to be 16 light years across, or about the distance from Earth to 40 Eridani. Observations suggest that even more powerful water masers may exist allowing them to be observed over cosmological distances. Someday, they may even play a role in resolving the vexing question, just how old the universe is. Within galaxies, including our own, water can form one of two ways. The direct way is from the energy of cosmic rays combining hydrogen and oxygen ions. In 2010, the Herschel Space Telescope observed a river of superheated steam traveling with the stellar wind from the red giant star C.W. Leonis, determined to have formed when carbon monoxide in the star's atmosphere was energized by cosmic rays, allowing the oxygen to recombine with hydrogen. More commonly, though, water forms as ice coating grains of interstellar dust. This is by far the most productive route, as model suggests that the easiest way for interstellar water to form is for molecular hydrogen to bond with frozen oxygen on a solid surface, such as a dust grain. Observations suggest that water vapor only comprises a tiny fraction of the water in any interstellar cloud, roughly one part in 1500, with most of it lying in a razor-thin layer near the edges, the rest existing as frozen ice. These ice grains may be the laboratories in which the first steps toward life began. Models showed that phosphine, the famous lethal chemical possibly recently discovered on Venus, can, when exposed to interstellar radiation, form phosphoric oxoacids, potential precursors to such molecules as DNA and ATP. Life's energy carrier. Similarly, amino nitriles, when exposed to molecules found in interstellar ice, form 2-deoxy-D-ribose, a fragment of that more familiar molecule deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. These experiments may go some way toward explaining why so many of the molecules necessary for life, such as sugars and amino acids, have been found in comets and meteorites. For decades, astronomers assumed that these comets and meteorites must have been the sole source of Earth's water. After all, Earth formed in a region too close to the Sun for any ice to condense. Unlike if Earth had been born in the frigid outer solar system, water could not be a part of its chemical makeup. Even if it had been, any such moisture would have been blasted away by the impact that formed the moon. But the more scientists looked, 
the less that story made sense. Water on Earth has a particular hydrogen to deuterium ratio, 26 parts per million. That acts like a fingerprint, and sample after sample of comets have returned deuterium ratios two to three times higher than those found in Earth's oceans, indicating that they couldn't have brought water to Earth. So, the answer had to be the asteroids, right? The outer rim of the asteroid belt is loaded with water. It even has its own population of active comets. Carbonaceous chondrites, basically watery asteroids that have crashed into Earth, show the same deuterium to hydrogen ratio as Earth, as do eukrite chondrites, which were born on the asteroid Vesta. Seemed like an open and shut case. Except, evidence suggests that Earth has been a water world for a very long time. Pillow basalts, the result of lava cooling in ocean water, have been found in rocks dating as far back as 4.2 billion years ago, just 300 million years after the lunogenic impact. Zircons, nearly indestructible minerals used as windows into Earth's earliest, most violent periods, suggest that Earth had water and an atmosphere 4.4 billion years ago. Rocks obtained by the Apollo moon missions even suggest that Earth could have possessed water before the moon formed. Also, while the asteroids possess a deuterium to hydrogen ratio equivalent to Earth's oceans today, evidence suggests that Earth's deuterium ratio has increased over time, as its early Venus-like atmosphere would have propelled lighter hydrogen into space. In 2020, a team at the University of Lorraine in France studied a sample of enstatite chondrites, meteorites of a similar composition to Earth, believed to have played a dominant role in its formation. They found that, while they were far drier than more distant asteroids, they contained enough water bound within their mineral structure to potentially account for Earth's entire water budget. It seems ever more likely that Earth was born a water world after all. There is water on the sun. A somewhat ear-bending statement, I'll admit, but a factual one. The temperature of the surface of the sun is, give or take, 5,800 kelvins. Too hot for water to exist. But at the hearts of sunspots, holes dug into the sun by its insanely strong magnetic field, temperatures fall to 4,000 kelvins. Just cool enough for the hardiest water molecules to persist even as most are torn into hydrogen and oxygen. When you consider that the mass of the Earth's entire ocean is less than a billion the mass of the Sun, it raises the question of just how much water might be clinging to existence in those isolated steaming clouds. Nor is the Sun alone in this. Among far cooler red dwarf stars, which of course make up the vast majority of stars in the universe, water vapor is a common feature in their atmospheres. Red giants, such as Betelgeuse and Antares, have also shown signs of water. It helps, of course, that they are often nearly all sunspot. As we descend the ladder, evidence for water actually becomes scarcer. So far, only a scattering of brown dwarfs, out of the hundreds known, have shown evidence for water in their atmospheres. While a 2019 study of 19 Jovian exoplanets found significantly less water than predicted, Water has also proven stubbornly elusive in the atmospheres of our own system's gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, likely because their distance from the Sun causes water to freeze and fall to deeper layers. But when we reach the realm of the Earth Combral planets, water suddenly rises again. As I outlined in my previous video on them, Uranus and Neptune, our solar system's so called ice giants, are between 10 and 20 times the mass of the Earth, and up to two-thirds of that mass is water. Rather unexpectedly, as the first truly representative samples of exoplanets began to roll in, the Neptunes proved to be the most common type of planet, vastly outnumbering even smaller planets such as super-Earths or terrestrials, and models suggest that they too are mostly water, though not necessarily as we understand it. When we think of water, we imagine it flowing down rivers or broiling in the ocean, perhaps even raining from the sky. But our common notion of water is derived from a highly biased sample, 
The vast majority of the water in the universe exists in interstellar space, where, deprived of the cover of an atmosphere or the warmth of a star, it can only exist as a solid or as a gas. The most common form of solid water is called Ice-1, specifically Ice-1-H, and it's pretty much what you'd expect to find on the ground after a cold snap. Ice-1-H is the familiar hexagonal form of ice that creates the intricate beauty of snowflakes. At lower temperatures of, say, minus 100 Celsius, Ice-1-H can shift its structure to become Ice-1-C, which is cubic in form rather than hexagonal. Together, these two forms of ice may be the most common forms of water in the universe. But there are competitors to that title. In the minuscule temperatures and pressures of interstellar space, an alternate form of ice emerges, usually on timescales of hundreds of millions of years. Called Ice-11, it is essentially a regimented form of Ice-1H, in which both the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms are forced into line. This form of ice is believed to be comparatively rare, but it may, once formed, insidiously convert the ice around it to its structure, much like the catastrophic, and thankfully fictional, Ice-9 in Kurt Vonnegut's novel Cat's Cradle. That novel was published five years before real Ice-9 was discovered, a hyper-ordered form of ice similar to Ice-11 that, thankfully, only forms at temperatures below 140 kelvins and pressures above 2,000 atmospheres. Most other forms of ice, that we know of at least, are similar, only likely to ever be observed in a laboratory. But the search for water outside our world has opened our eyes to possible exceptions. By far the most alien of these water forms is also the closest to home. Beneath the placid, beautiful skies of Uranus and Neptune, nestled under trillions of tons of seething, superheated water, under pressures of millions of atmospheres and temperatures of thousands of degrees, may be the most bizarre form of water ever discovered. Ice 18, also called superionic ice. Only first synthesized in 2005, Ice 18 is black, electrically conductive, and as dense as diamond. When crushed to a certain point, water disassociates into a lattice of oxygen atoms floating in a sea of freely flowing, positively charged hydrogen ions, creating an electric dynamo. To our eyes, this form of ice seems alien, even corrupted, but with such water worlds as Uranus and Neptune likely to outnumber every other planet in the universe, Ice 18 could be the true representative form of water. In 2019, scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory successfully created superionic ice after modeling the interiors of Uranus and Neptune. If the models are correct, then Ice 18 would comprise the majority of these planets' masses. And when you consider that the total amount of water in the solar system outside of Uranus and Neptune is about half the amount in either one, it's fair to say that Ice 18 is the commonest form of water in our, or indeed any, solar system. But there is yet another form of ice that may have taken even Ice 18's crown, Many of the so-called super-Earths, those that straddle the line between terrestrial worlds like our own and ice giants like Neptune. Not Earths with slightly more water, but worlds in which water comprises up to 50% their entire mass, as opposed to 0.05% for Earth. Such worlds, such as Gliese 436b, would have oceans tens or even hundreds of times deeper than Earth's and a combination of immense pressure and higher gravity would condense the bottom layers of water into high-pressure forms of ice, specifically Ice-5, a form of ice under 5,000 atmospheres that better resembles gem crystal, and Ice-7, a cubic form of ice that only forms at pressures of 30,000 atmospheres. Models suggest that up to a third of all exoplanets may possess such ice. But to be frank, that's not what we want. However watery such worlds may be, they will never be home. To sail the surface of such a world would be to endure a fog of scalding steam and near Venus-level temperatures. The closest to home we could expect to find such ice would be in the sunless depths of Jupiter's moon Europa. What we want to see are those precious jewels, 
those touched enough by water to serve as cradles for life, but not so much as to drown it forever. Despite surveys bringing the number of known exoplanets into the thousands of all masses and orbits, so far, the golden trinity in our search for Earth 2, Earth mass, water, and in the habitable zone, has not been found. The closest we've come so far was in 2019, when two independent studies detected water in the atmosphere of K218b, a planet orbiting a red dwarf 124 light years away. With an orbital period of just 33 days, K218b nonetheless lies within its star's habitable zone, with a stellar irradiance almost identical to that of Earth. Unfortunately, it is also eight times Earth's mass, and its density, at just twice that of water, suggests it is an ocean world. But with the next generation of telescopes coming online, it seems only a matter of time before the universe of water unveils to us another of its most precious creations. And so, like the great river Oceanus, we have circled the world and returned to where we started, the great cosmic ocean. It seems as best a place as any to end the universe of water series, for now at least. I may revisit certain topics should more information come to light, and of course, there are always topics I may have forgotten to include. I'll be honest, when I started this series, I did not expect it to be 15 episodes long, or to encompass nearly four and a half years of my life. I strive to be comprehensive in my videos, and this series often took me way out of my element, if you will. But for all the struggle it took me to get here, I am pleased with the result, and I hope you are as well. My next big series has already begun with the episode on Venus. Inspired by David Sobel's book, The Planets, it will be an exploration of the seven classical planets from a mythical, historical, and, of course, scientific perspective. My next video in the series, likely on the Sun, will debut sometime in the new year. There is much to do before then, including, COVID willing, the continuation of my New Year's series, which I know many of you have been asking for. Thank you to everyone who has stuck with me for all this time, and for anyone just signing on, please like, comment, and subscribe. Stay curious, fellow seekers.